Hello, advanced English learners. Welcome back to another native English speaker conversation. I'm joined by the one and only Greg. Thank you for joining me, Greg. Of course. So this is a topic Greg suggested, and I'm excited to talk about it. We've gotten some suggestions about business topics. It seems like that is something that a lot of people are interested in. So today's topic is going to be about the evolution of Microsoft, and we're going to look into different business strategies. And the reason we're talking about this topic is to give you some business vocabulary and expressions, and maybe even some strategies to apply to your own work. So let's get into it. We'll be right back after this short break. All right. So where do you think we should start with this, Greg? Yeah. I mean, Microsoft is a company that's been around that seems like for ages, right? Depending on how old you are, it was an innovative tech startup, or it's just something emerged in the dinosaur era before you were born. But suffice to say, today, Microsoft is still a dominant tech company right at the very top. And anytime a company has been so successful over so many years, it's worth taking a closer look to figure out maybe what their secret sauce is. How have they stayed relevant for so long? So let's define the term secret sauce. Secret sauce is a term that is used a lot in business. It sounds like it's a made up thing, but if you think about it, I think it originates from this idea that let's say one restaurant is making barbecue chicken one way and another restaurant is making barbecue chicken another way, but the other restaurant is really famous for their barbecue chicken. And it just seems like, oh, regular barbecue chicken, but it must be the barbecue sauce. So it has these overtones of culinary delights and how you feel about maybe when you eat something that's really delicious. So that can be applied to business as well. Yeah, I think that's a good example. The idea is certain foods can be very similar, but one just always tastes better than the other. And so it's as if that food had some secret sauce. What is that little secret ingredient that makes it tick? And that same concept can apply to a business, right? Sometimes businesses seem very similar. There are a lot of software companies out there. Why is Microsoft such a successful company? What is their secret sauce? Yeah, their longevity is testament to the fact that they must have some secret sauce. Yes. In there. Yes. So let's take a look. And sometimes to determine the secret sauce, it's useful to go back in time a little bit, figure out what their origin was and how they've evolved. And so that's what we're going to do here, starting with the original form of Microsoft, which was actually an operating system. Right. So your OS, your operating system, for example, on your computer, you might be an Apple operating software or a Microsoft operating system. Exactly. Yeah. Operating system. Exactly. And yeah, Microsoft started with MS-DOS way back in the day. And for those of you who are our age or older, you'll remember loading up your system with a command line, right? You type something in and you get some information. There wasn't a mouse that you could use. I was going to say, I remember playing computer games, educational computer games. I didn't play video games, but I played computer games and thoroughly enjoyed that in my childhood. There was no mouse. So it was all keyboard. Exactly. Yeah. You entered your selection using numbers or letters and it was a very different era, but somehow at that age and in that era, we all found that to be an excellent form of entertainment. Nowadays you would play a game like that or use a, an operating system like that and be like, what is going on? Are we in the stone age? But back then that was very sophisticated stuff. And this is back in the like eighties, nineties. Yeah. Eighties, nineties. Exactly. So. I'm trying to remember the first time I came out with a GUI. A GUI is a graphic user interface, a graphical user interface. That's an interface where you actually have a mouse can move around. That was sometime in the 90s. Our audience, they have the privilege of Wikipedia so they can figure out the exact history. But there were a couple releases with the mouse and then the real big release that, that changed everything was Windows XP. Okay, so why was that such an iconic moment? for the Microsoft journey. Windows XP was the ultimate manifestation of this graphical user interface. I would call it Microsoft as an operating system, mm, right? Okay. At that point, Windows XP had the highest penetration of any operating system. And it just felt like no other operating system was relevant. 
right? It was that pervasive, particularly in businesses and institutions. Microsoft was everywhere. And one might wonder, why were they so successful with businesses? Okay. And the answer is, not only did they have this great operating system, they also had a really nice productivity suite. Mm -hmm. Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft PowerPoint, yes. Microsoft Office. Microsoft Office. So first they had this operating system. Then they introduced this incredible productivity suite, which was Microsoft Office. And so when we say suite, it's <clears throat> several applications that are technically used in synchrony, meaning together, to get the job done. For example, someone with the Microsoft Office suite would probably be using Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, which we just call PowerPoint, Microsoft. Excel. Excel. My favorite. Greg's really yeah. good at Excel. And then, of course, Outlook, right, for your email. And then what's the one that they have for video conferencing? For video conferencing, they purchased Skype. So that was theirs. They also have team conferencing through Teams. That's the Microsoft one. Microsoft Teams. Teams. They have a note-taking app, Microsoft OneNote. Which I really like. Yeah. So all of these apps over time emerged to reinforce this productivity suite. And so companies love that because they have an operating system that came bundled with this productivity suite. Everything worked well together. And so because of that, they're like, this makes my life easy and it keeps our employees productive. So we're just going to buy this. We're not even going to consider any other options. And the final, I would say, arrow in their quiver, that's another term, right? This is a military term. When archers have a quiver of arrows, um, and you can think of the company as the archer, and the various arrows are their competitive weapons. So the final arrow in their quiver was their web browser, the Internet Explorer. Which, how do you feel about? Do you feel like people are still using Internet Explorer? So Internet Explorer has mirrored Microsoft itself in terms of its development and popularity. Okay. There was a time when Internet Explorer was so popular, it dominated like over 90% of web browsers used, maybe even higher. It might have been like in the high 90s. And I think this was in the 90s and 2000s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Definitely in the 90s. Everyone only used Internet Explorer because everyone only used Microsoft Office, or I should say the operating system, Windows, right? Because it came bundled. This idea of bundling the operating system with all the software. And you didn't have to pay extra for those. If it you came. didn't. It came free. Very good point. Yeah. That's a huge part of it. The fact that this was all free, which is just crazy. What a great business strategy. It's a great exactly. model for, so yeah. you're selling your key product, which is the operating system. Yep. And then you say, okay, and as a perk, we're giving you this amazing productivity suite software for free. Exactly. Well, strictly speaking, the office wasn't free, but it was close to free. Given the amount of value it was providing for these companies, the cost was negligible because they were buying this operating system. And over time, they actually started to switch and they started charging less for the operating system and more for the productivity suite. But ultimately, Microsoft got busted Meaning they got called out for something. They yeah. To get in trouble. Yeah, yeah. A police will bust a criminal. They'll bust like, a robber. Or like the kindergarten teacher busted the kindergartners for skipping out on lunchtime. Something um, like that. Yeah, they'll catch them playing outside and busted. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, Microsoft got busted for basically anti-competitive behavior. The argument was that because they were bundling so many things together, there was no way for other software providers to compete with them. So they were making it impossible to be competitive and they gained a monopoly. That's it. Yeah, they created a monopoly. And when you have a monopoly, the problem is it, early on in a monopoly, it seems great. So yeah, of course they have a monopoly. This is such a good product. But over time, because they have a monopoly and there's no new entrance to the market, no new competitors. There's no innovation. There's no innovation. They get lazy. And that's problematic. So if you've noticed like some of your favorite software and maybe there's like a suite, right? So I'm thinking there's like Microsoft suite, there's Adobe suite, there are Apple suite type things. Yep. If you notice that certain apps start to glitch you might say, okay, well, that's interesting. I wonder why. It always makes me think that maybe they got a little lazy. They got a little <laughs> complacent. There are too many bugs here and no one's fixing them. Yeah. And that turns you off from the product because then you're going to want to seek other products that can do the job as well, if not better, as whatever you're using. If they're not fixing the bugs, the software bugs, right, when things glitch and they 
act out of sync and out of whack. Totally, and guess what happened? New entrants came for exactly that reason, right? Microsoft started getting, it became notorious for being buggy, right? Freezing a lot, easy to get viruses on. People started thinking, maybe there are alternatives, mm -hmm. right? And you started, Mac OS started becoming more popular. And Mac OS was famous for being very smooth, right? With very few errors, partly because they create a very controlled experience. So there's less you can do on a Mac in terms of flexibility, or it's harder to do the more sort of customized operations, but it's also a much more contained experience that ensures it's more smooth. So anyways, suddenly Microsoft had new competitors coming in who could do specific things better than Microsoft. Um, they were also forced to decouple some of their apps from each other that allowed other software providers to compete. So what does that mean, decoupling the apps? So we said before that they're bundled. Yes. When something's bundled, that means they all come together. It's like a bundle of hay, yeah. a bundle of straw. Um, when you decouple, that's the opposite of bundling, right? Coupled, when something's coupled, they're two things together. When right. you decouple it, you're splitting it apart. So you're offering for them to be sold a la carte, sold separately, in other exactly. words. Exactly, or at least provided separately, if, even if they're not sold, but provided separately. So that all started happening, and Microsoft's grip on the operating system and on the productivity suite started slipping a little bit. But the bigger change was not that. It was the switch to mobile. Okay, so now we're talking about switching to getting off of your computer and going more onto phones. Phones, that's the big thing, the smartphone, right? The introduction of the smartphone made it such that suddenly we didn't need to be on our computers to do things. In fact, recent studies are showing that a lot of people, well, this is before the pandemic era, when people were not working at home as much, studies were showing that most people no longer owned a computer of their own. They just used the computer at work, and then they would be on their phone the rest of the day or evening. And of course, that changed when people started working remotely, working from home. but. Before that, it was starting to seem like people didn't really need computers at home because their needs were met at work and through their mobile devices. So for Microsoft to then switch to that makes a lot of sense, right? They didn't at first, and that was the problem. Ah. They, they were so confident in their sort of chokehold on the industry that they were very slow to migrate to mobile. They didn't take it very seriously. Of course, the first smartphones uh, you could argue we're the Apple smartphones, or the iPhones, but really I would argue it's the BlackBerry, right? The BlackBerry was, in my experience, the first real smartphone that could send emails, you could use Google Maps, but it was still kind of a, a janky experience. It was the iPhone that came in and made a really nice ex user experience. So suddenly now you had these little computers in your hand and that's not what Microsoft Windows is good for. It's not what Microsoft Office is good for, right? So those apps couldn't run on this phone. And people, so people didn't need computers anymore. They had their phones. So that also means they didn't need anything that Microsoft was providing. That's what you call an existential threat, right? Your existence is in peril. Right. So now Microsoft has to decide, okay, where do we move from here? If no one's using our operating system, no one cares about our apps anymore, how are we going to get people <laughs> back into the fold? Exactly. How do we keep people, how do we keep people in our system, in our ecosystem? And that is when they started exploring cloud service offerings. Okay, so let's define the cloud service offerings just so that people are on the same page. So cloud service is computer software that's provided remotely, right? Instead of running locally on your system, it used to be you would get a CD or a floppy disk and install a game or an application using that CD and it would be stored on your computer's local hard drive. Instead, with cloud software, it's provided remotely. And so when you open up an application, you're opening it up through your web browser. You have to have a stable internet connection. You need in a stable words. internet connection. Provided that you do, you can do everything using the power of the servers provided by that company instead of your dinky old computer. <laughs> yeah. So it means you can run much more sophisticated applications on a very simple device. Now, what's an example of a very simple device? A smartphone. So suddenly, by moving their software to the cloud, Microsoft was able to regain relevance even on a phone, yeah. right? Because you could start using the applications on a phone. 
So they discovered a product market fit, right? So they looked at the market, what the market needed, what the way society was evolving, the way technology was evolving, the way our needs were changing. Suddenly, everyone has a smartphone. Not everyone has a computer at home or cares to have a computer at home, but everyone's on their smartphones and they need access to certain apps, which they can get instead of plugging into a hard drive. You don't even have CD-ROMs anymore no. on the computers. Yeah. They're redundant. Then they decided, okay, let's move to the cloud software. Exactly. And what that enables also is whether or not you're on your phone, it also can work cross-platform. So it can work on Android, it can work on iOS, it can work on an Apple. All you need is a web browser because the software is running within the web browser. And so that means it can be used on any device. And that is super powerful because suddenly they can operate in a platform agnostic way. It means it doesn't matter what platform it's on, which means they don't have to worry about hardware compatibility anymore. It's all in the cloud. Yeah. And so it gives them this advantage that they didn't used to have. It gives them this flexibility. Um, and once again, for businesses, it makes it easy for businesses to incorporate this kind of software because it can run on anything that the business has. And what's really cool too is that you might be an avid Microsoft user, but that does not exclude you from then also using another company's software and apps such as Google, right? You might also be a Google Cloud subscriber. So the two are not uh, mutually exclusive. You can be subscribers to both, which is great. So you just hit on the final new arrow in their quiver, which is subscriptions. Okay. So what does cloud also unlock? Probably most importantly, it unlocks the subscription model, right? Prior to that, software was sold a la carte. Right. When you buy a new Windows version, you own that Windows version and get some security updates, but it doesn't really change. Um, when you buy Microsoft Office, it used to be called Office 2012, 2013. And I remember you'd have to purchase the CD-ROM. Yeah. And, and you would install it, and then you would just save the CD-ROM somewhere in case you needed to restart or update your computer, rather. You would then get the next update of the software. You'd then purchase another set of CD-ROMs. Yeah. And now that's changed, right? Nowadays, you don't buy upgrades most of the time, unless you're upgrading a tier of service. Instead, you have a subscription which gets continually updated over time. Companies also really like this, right? Yeah. Businesses prefer to pay in smaller increments throughout the year rather than big upfront payments at the start of the year. And so by switching to the subscription model, they can make it easier for businesses and individuals to pay for their services and also ensured a longer steady stream of revenue that was harder to pirate, right? That was another thing. Piracy was a big thing. If you were buying a one-off piece of software, that could get copied and pirated and you could basically get it illegally for free. Nowadays with subscription services, it's much harder to pirate because those subscription services are constantly pinging the server and constantly checking that this is an authentic account. That was the final thing that cemented their now dominant position in the market once more. So they're doing really well. Isn't it interesting to see an evolution of something like a mega tech company like Microsoft and even though there are some dips, right, to their success, they then looked again to the market. They looked at what the what users needed and wanted. I'm sure they ran studies and had surveys and all of that. And then they implemented it so that they could then rise again to a place where they want to be, which is on top. <laughs> exactly. The key is that they didn't rest on the laurels. They did, but then they started to slip. And so, they got wise. So resting on your laurels, I love this expression. So laurels are, think of them as like bay leaves, Daphne leaves, laurel leaves. So those are the leaves that are from Apollo, right? The god of, he's a god of different things, music, healing, different things. And he was the person, or <laughs> not the person, the god who popularized the laurel leaf, the wreath, right? And that Olympians like to use too as their sign of victory. So laurel leaves and the, the wreath, so to speak, is a symbol of victory. So resting on your laurels means you're basking in your glory. You're just enjoying your victorious moments, your victorious history, but not thinking about competition. You're not thinking about What's innovation. Next? So you're becoming complacent. And that's a problem if you want to keep your status. 
Exactly, yeah. Any business, when they start to rest on the laurels, generally a new competitor comes in and takes their cake. And that's why this is a good lesson in not resting on your laurels. They did for a little bit, and then they quickly got back on and got back on the sort of the, the wagon, so to speak, and are now performing very well. Yeah, so I think a big lesson there is to stay humble, stay hungry, keep your head down, and just keep working. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so hopefully you took away some nice business strategies yourself. You heard some nice business vocabulary expressions, some pointers that you can share with your friends. This is great dinner table conversation, great conversation that you can have in the office or with your friends, maybe at a meal or a coffee time. So hopefully you enjoyed it. Let us know what you think. And we're always open to hearing from you what kinds of other topics you'd like for us to talk about here. So you can fill out the form that I have. It's linked below. And I'd love for you to share a sentence or two to back it up, to elaborate. That would be really helpful. So we look forward to seeing you in the next one. We're going to be doing that very soon. Bye for now and happy advanced English learning, everyone.